as, as many of you know, Pete injects a lot of it humor into his presentations. The rumor is that Rick Mercer would not have agreed to appear on Tuesday if he had been if he had known that he was going to be competing with Pete. Anyway, you're not really here to listen to me. You're here to listen to Pete. So I'm going to turn the floor over to him. Yeah, OK, it's my last tan height. And I, I was thinking of going all out and doing something crazy, like wearing shoes and a suit. <laughs> but, but you know, I'm too conservative of a guy to wear shoes and a suit. I just don't like doing things out of the ordinary. And you notice I've used my full title, Reverend Pete. Yes, I was ordained on the net. And you can be, too. You just go to <laughs> no. You just go to the Universal Life Church. Oh, I should be standing here. Let me stand here. OK, you go to the Universal Life Church, fill out the forms, and you get ordained. And it works. I've done marriages, OK? If somebody wanted to get, some friends wanted to get married on top of a mountain. I was the only one that would go up there and do it for them. Uh, so like, if you want to go wild, you know they talk about Vegas. Well, we could do the same thing here at Can Height, OK? <laughs> Whatever. And I can forgive sins. But only in Quebec. But the, <laughs> but the casino is in Quebec tonight. So if you want to go all out, come and see me in the morning. OK? So here we go. Uh, forward into the past. OK, purpose of this talk, you'll learn nothing. It's just for fun. It's fun to speculate what will happen. It's by looking at things that happened in the past and well, where will they go to in the future, you know, just to make you think. And to make you laugh at horrible things, because there's nothing else you can do but laugh at them. So that's where we're going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have no investments in the tinfoil industry. Although, if you want to do this, we can set up a boff on building these things afterwards. OK. But I have no investment, so I'm not, making, I'm not making a cent out of that. OK, so the first thing is going back to school. OK, math and history, right? We're looking at things in the past, and you got to go back to school. That was in the past. First thing is history. OK, I was in fourth grade. Sister Mary Henry said to me, history is your most important subject. If you don't know the past, you're doomed to repeat it. We said, yeah, yeah. Well, she's just saying that just because nobody likes history and she wants to try to give some justification to it. But you know, she was right. That's okay. <laughs> if you read Sherlock Holmes, he's uh, one of his famous things is he says, Nothing new under the sun. It's all been done before. He studied the old crimes, and there was a new crime. He'd say, well, it's the same thing as the one from 50 years ago, whatever. So it's important to look back in the past. For example, identity theft. We think that's, you know, that's a, something new. Is it a new crime? Well, John Lennon talked about it back in 68, that poor walrus, right? I mean, that's identity theft he's talking about. OK, it was freaky stuff, but it was identity theft. Shakespeare had all kinds of things. Somebody dressing up as somebody else to trick somebody. That's identity theft. But it goes back even further, back to the Old Testament when, with Esau and Jacob, right? When Esau, um, Jacob had hairy arms. Esau didn't, and he wanted to fool his father, who was kind of blind. So he put the lamb skins on his arm, and his father thought he was um, he was the brother, and he blessed him. Uh, so, I mean, identity theft is really old. There's nothing new there. Okay? Nothing new under the sun. It's easier now, identity theft, right? The net makes things easier. You don't have to put lambskin on your arms to steal somebody's identity. Thieves can rob you from, your ba from their basement. Something else. You always hear them say prostitution is the oldest profession. It's not. Engineering is the oldest profession. Social engineering. OK, back again, Genesis, the first page just about, or the second page, when the serpent tricked Eve. I mean, that's social engineering. So you know, all of this stuff is way old stuff. But you just give things you know, a new fancy name, and everybody thinks it's something new. It's not. OK, now we get to the math. 
curve fitting. You have a bunch of points and you got to draw a curve that goes through it. That used to be fun. Interpolation to find points in the middle, but it's extrapolation we want to use. Okay, so for example, like here, this is the population of California over the different years, and you see it increasing. And it's fairly easy. You say, where is it going to be? Okay, this is a 10 year old, what year is it? 13 year old graph. And it's easy to say where it's going to be then, and you can just sort of predict, and it probably will be. And you can do that with all kinds of things. In order to get a good fit, the more data points you have, the more accurate your fit can be. So the more you know about the past, the better that you can predict the future. And remember, today is tomorrow's past. Did I say that right? Yeah. Okay. So we want to go here. We go to, got to go back to these days. Remember when you had to send Google the postcards and fill it in and you get the results <laughs> back in 30 days? Another thing in math that's important is inflection points. Where a curve changes, actually I'm a little bit more liberal than the strict. The mathematical interpretation is when it goes from concave to convex or the other way around. It, for me, I'm just treating it as if a curve that's going one way suddenly changes into something else. But they're important things to know about too. Okay, so some inflection points of the past. When Al Gore created the net, Okay, that's not a joke. <laughs> that's not a joke. He opened it up to commercial business and started all of the evil stuff. Before that, the net was good. It was run by just university people. And we shared and cooperated. Boy, were we dumb. But, you know, that's the way the net was. And then Al Gore said, no more funding. You got to sell it. So we sold our souls. When Cantor and Siegel, but that was, a, that was a critical point on the net. Cantor and Siegel's first spam. And then their... Um, ISP killed their account. So they sued their ISP saying, hey, it's not against the law to do this. You can't kill our account. The I love you virus. It was the first time that social engineering was used to spread a virus. Before that, they were purely technical on the disk drive you'd put in and so on. I love you. You see the subject that says I love you and is coming. Oh, why did she send me that? Got a lot of people. Okay. <laughs> JavaScript. Oh, I got me five times. JavaScript. <laughs> JavaScript, when all of a sudden the web became executable on your machine, changed a whole bunch of things. Stuxnet, oh, I forget what that was. So let's skip over that. I don't want to talk about it. There's too, too many RCMP around here. <laughs> okay, first time, a first known time a government's been involved in some serious creation. So it's important to look at these points because when these points happen, things change afterwards. Uh, some points coming soon, facial recognition, right? When you come with your iPhone, you see somebody on the street, and then you circle their face and then do a Google search and find their, their Facebook page, find pictures of whatever. That's going to be a... It's right there. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Google Yeah. It's when it's full, easy to use, it's yeah. Okay. And the voice recognition, the same thing. Okay. So I'm talking about the future. How good am I? I'm bad. Okay. For this talk, I went back through and I stole a few things from some of my older talks to 99 when I talked in Quebec City and uh, Net 99, which was the forerunner to the Can Heights. Um, oh, no, but this was before that. In 88, I had my students build uh, transfer voice on the network. I called it network walkie-talkie. I said, this is fun to be able to send voice on the net, but there's no future there. Okay? <laughs> I mean, that's why I can't afford shoes, right? I don't have the vision to. Okay. In 89... We were doing things with music, like we had nexts, okay? Doing things with music, and I said, boy, could you imagine? You could almost put together music and blend music and distribute music on the net. There'd never be enough bandwidth for that. Okay, 99 in Quebec, I talked about organized crime using the net, but everyone knew that. I talked about the governments using the net for warfare and viruses, and it never came true, so I'm not, I'm not good at this kind of stuff. But what does it mean? It means it's easy to predict things. You just have to know what you're uh, looking at, if it's important, and well, that's it. 
But you know, we do learn from the past, right? Okay, let's look at wireless communication. When information goes through the air, anybody can listen. And if you don't believe me, do this experiment. Turn on the radio in your car, you hear it. Then try it in a friend's car and you hear it, right? Information in the air, anybody can hear it. Okay, so the first generation of cell phones came out, uh, 78 it was uh, in North America, unencrypted, easily, easy to eavesdrop to it, susceptible to cloning and so on. By the 90s, they had encryption. Wi-Fi first came out. It was easy to sniff on it, uh, susceptible to, you know, uh, same thing. It was 99 that WEP came out and 2003 that a decent encryption started coming out. Um, even though in 76, Diffie Hellman showed us that we could, without pre-shared keys, keys, we could set up an encrypted session. Okay, Bluetooth comes out, pure, poor authentication, initially no encryption. The protocol between your wireless phone and the home thing comes out, no encryption. Then there was a proprietary encryption that was cracked. You know, RFID credit cards, right from your pocket now. <laughs> They're stealing them. Do you see a trend? Okay, you get something to market, and then once it's there, then you do it right. Okay, so we got an exercise, like this is like a class, okay? From the following graph, try to predict the security of the next generation wireless protocol, okay? Okay, yeah, you're right. And later on, I wanna have a boff. You know what RFID can hide cards? We'll try to use in our iPhones to try to steal somebody else's drink tickets. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the Smurf? Small connectionless packet, a ping, that would result in a lot more packets being returned. Caused a lot of problems. Okay, DNS was limited to 512 byte packets and then it had to go up to TCP. Along comes extended DNS that can have much more. The Smurf lives again, <laughs> exact same thing. We don't remember the Smurf, I don't know, maybe they were cute. So what do we learn from the past? From the past, we learn that we don't <laughs> learn from the past. <laughs> Another thing that we look at is scale. Okay, let's look at some bank robbers. Jesse James, typical take on a bank robbery was $6,000. John Dillinger, 34 to, I think I put an extra zero in there. I'm not good, I'm dyslexic. 34 to $7,400 were his takes. Okay, and then as we get later on, the White Eagle robbery, 7.2 million, the Dunbar robbery, 18.9 million. That was 97, that was the largest cash robbery to date. Okay, then comes cyber banking, and the robbery's there, 45 million, 74 million. Okay, so let's look at the business case for this. You hire eight programmers for a year. <laughs> You hire a project manager because you gotta have that project manager to keep you on time, on budget, and you know, okay, and you have yourself. So you rob a bank of 74 million, each of you gets $7.4 million for a year's work, okay? That's almost twice what they pay me here at the university. <laughs> so it's not a bad business deal. So let's look at it for the bank. They pay a million dollars for security and hope nothing happens and nothing happens. So then budget comes, cutting comes next year. Hey, nothing's happening here. Give me back that million dollars, right? It's, there's an imbalance there, okay? We perform threat and risk. The crooks, they do work and reward analysis of things. <laughs> you gotta think of things like that. See, you're laughing at something that's not funny. It's serious. <laughs> okay? And the rewards keep getting larger. Okay, credit cards, ATM, a similar kind of growth there. Okay, exercise two, we have a graph. And again, you see it. 
uh, increasing. But you notice the inflection point. That was when cybercrime started coming. The scale started getting a lot larger. Before that, it was just probably inflation or something like that. OK, so what caused the inflection point? OK, well, one thing, electronic cash is lighter, and you don't need a big truck to take it away. You know, there is that physical limit. The $19 million ha cash heist, that would take a big truck. OK, but there's also, and these are the big ones, the consolidation of companies and the interconnection. Wrong button. OK, Cons consolidation is a double whammy. OK, in the past, we, there were dozens of independent credit card companies, and each one was relatively small. When I worked at a gas station as a kid, they would each week they'd give us a page of all of their stolen credit cards. And they said, remember these names. And if you see them, report them and we'll give you 10 bucks. OK, and I used to do that every day I'd remember it. And I remember one of the names on it. I'm serious. This was the guy's name he registered for his credit card. Larceny Culpepper. OK, <laughs> I mean, it's 40. 45 years later, and I still remember that, OK? But that was the way it worked, looking for fraudulent cards. In the past, banks were independent. But now we have mega banks, OK? The targets are much, much larger than they used to be. And there's a double consolidation when you get to things like credit cards. The stores, you got stores like Walmart and Amazon, the amount that they're processing through it, there are more targets, more attack points. Um, for large amounts, okay? Interconnection, <laughs> banks, credit card companies, now they're all interconnected for real-time transactions, right? You access your bank from anywhere in the world. Remember traveler's checks? Don't leave home without them. You don't need that. You go to the machine in the corner and poof, out comes money, okay? So there's a much larger attack service. If your scam is through ATMs, you don't do it like against, say, La, La Caisse over here in Hull. I don't do it from here. I'll go to England and do it from there. A lot harder to, to uh, track things, to do things, OK? So does this remind you of something like services getting centralized, access from anywhere in the world? No, it doesn't remind me of anything either. <laughs> Um, a lot of the bank and theft breaches are done because of trusted partners, okay? You get a small bank in a less developed country and you use that against the larger bank. Some of the really big ones recently, that's sort of the way they worked, okay? So let's go to more math. Okay, this is from abstract algebra. The transitive law. If A has a relationship with B and B has the same relationship with C, then A has that relationship with C. Example, the greater than. If A or less than. If A is less than B and B is less than C, well, then A has to be less than C. Okay. Trust relationships are transitive. Okay, it's the basis of federations and certificates and things like that. But does it really scale? OK, I trust my son, JR. JR trusts his wife, Fanny. Fanny trusts Alice, her friend. She trusts somebody else. She trusts somebody else. Back to Mike. And Mike trusts Larson, Larceny Culpepper. <laughs> so I trust Larceny Culpepper. <laughs> Maybe the reality and the math models don't scale. OK, so who do you trust? How many certificates in Netscape 4.2? There were a handful. I counted the other day. I could have counted wrong. 310 in Firefox. <laughs> Remember this? When Firefox, when they found some certificates in there uh, and they didn't know what they were or how they got there? Yeah. And we trust these for our banking, for whatever. But at least a certificate authority has never been used. <laughs> Whoops. OK. Yeah. OK. And they're the ones we know about. You know, it's possible for a government to order a certificate authority to give them certain things to get back doors into something. But I mean, I, you know, government's never going to tell somebody like Google or some big company to do something to, for them. Nah, that doesn't happen. But uh, they can get in there at the certificates authority if it's necessary and do it. So what we're seeing here is chains of trusts are getting longer. 
with certificates, international banking. Uh, it's all of that chain of trust and the attacks are always against the weakest link. It's a foundation and is the foundation starting to crumble? What are some of the other foundation parts? We gotta look at them, okay? Software these days, extremely layered. Okay, nobody works at the low level stuff anymore. And they all depend on that low level stuff, drivers, Linux distributions, software libraries, they all depend on that for doing their higher level stuff. So, but those things, they're not targets by themselves, but if you can get something into them, you got a really good foothold into things. You got to realize the value of things like that. Some other foundations like the routers, chipsets. Imagine getting a back door into some kind of a chipset. Wow, root DNS, government backdoors. Would you buy a router from China? Okay, you can test these things, but you cannot prove the absence of backdoors, right? I have a router. I say, well, if I receive a packet that has the Christmas tree bits set and it comes from a Martian IP address, and then three hours later, I receive a packet from another IP address that has this, and then two minutes after that, you're never going to get that kind of stuff in testing. But if you want to put a back door, you do something really weird like that, and then it wakes up. So, well, you got nothing to do but to trust your routers. We put a lot of trust in our foundations, just like we do on our highway bridge. <laughs> um, the information, this is something else, information value over time. An accurate weather report for two weeks from now is kind of valuable. An accurate weather report from two weeks ago doesn't have much value. Information, its value can change as time goes on. Okay, 20 years ago, who would have thought that you had to keep your birth, well, okay, if you don't want people to know how old you are, but in general, to, to keep your birth date a secret, who would have thought that 20 years ago? Now, yo, you don't want that to happen. Okay, yeah, remember Arlo Guthrie. Yeah, don't have to take out, if you got a lot of space, you don't have to take out your garbage for a long time. Dumpster diving in Olympic event starting in the 70s, okay, but archaeologists were doing it way before that. But what about our digital garbage? What do we think about that? Okay, storage getting larger and larger. You don't have to clean up. You just get more space. Get a new PC, copy everything from the old one into a folder called, everybody's laughing because they do it, right? <laughs> old PC, okay. Web people, they don't delete the sites that are gone. They just remove the links to them so they appear that they're gone. And what's in that garbage? Okay. Will things in our digital garbage have more value in the future? We didn't realize the value of things in the past. We don't know what's in our garbage. What's going to be there? Okay. SCADA systems, they're making the news these days because uh, they have poor security, they have back doors. They're managed by people in general with little technical skills. So the manufacturers say, well, we better put a back door in it in case they screw up the passwords. We want to be able to get into it. Okay, they didn't learn to protect them. <laughs> Let's look at some things that are coming. Look at your car. Just for example, your car, everything's controlled by computers and cars these days. You got a thing called a CAN bus. It's easy to read, to connect to. You can connect to it with the um, plug thing that they use for doing tests on your car. Uh, it's easy to feed into it. It's easy to fuzz. Fuzzing for the less technical is instead of sending the data you're supposed to send, it's supposed to send everything all at once or every possible combination, okay? A guy, Mark Mayfred, has a good talk on hacking your car. 2% of all accidents are caused by car malfunction. 98% are caused by driver error. Autonomous driving cars allow for more density on the highway. Computers have faster reaction time than humans. More density on highway implies greater fuel savings. Hey, we could do a lot with that. 
better secure them though because you can really fuzz your car and you see the lights blink on and off and the radio go and um, whatever. Medical instruments, now this is a fun thing. They're really just like scatter systems, right? There's some of them that have outputs for controlling things. Some of them have inputs, okay? Hacking your medical equipment on Black Hat there. Um, another thing on defibrillators being hacked. The laws that we have on privacy for medical stuff, they're really based at what was paper records that have become digital. They're not on the whole thing of digital stuff, okay? Um, but you know, I would much rather that you find my paper medical records and find out about my sex change operation last year than this bar in China, because they can't crack the signal from HBO, so for Friday night entertainment, they're watching my colonoscopy on the TV. I don't want that to happen. But future medicine, we're getting even better, okay? They're doing stuff connecting things directly to the brain, okay? Here, the brain moving things, they have artificial limbs that you're able to control by, the, uh, by your brain being connected directly to the brain. They have artificial vision, okay? Some sensors inputting colors and stuff like that connected directly to the brain. Again, we had that back in the 60s, okay? Imagine fuzzing something like this, somebody's vision into there and fuzzing it. Well, that's what we had in the 60s. We called it LSD, okay? <laughs> So a monkey brain makes a robot walk. There's lots of things being connected directly to the brain. I wonder if it's encrypted. Okay, and there's simply sensors, controllers connected to the CPU. It's a control system. Now, we have the bandwidth. I'm not gonna go for that that fooled me 20 years ago. We have the bandwidth. Those things don't have to be close. This is like fun speculation, right? You build up a body with all of the sensors in it and the movements, so you can vacation in England without leaving your chair, okay? We got the bandwidth to send the signals and the sensors away over there. Just think of that, invasion of the body snatchers takes on a whole new meaning. You're a consumer. Anybody here ever buy a toaster? Yeah, a couple. Anybody here ever buy a car? Yeah, a couple. Anybody here ever buy a computer? Eh, few. Okay, toaster. Early toasters were dangerous. You get fires, shocks from them, and they'd always burn the toast. Okay, but nowadays their safety is certified by UL, CSA, and so on, and they come with warnings. Don't use the toaster while taking a bath. You know, things like that? <laughs> You know, I got one of those, um, you know the things you put in the windshield of your car to keep the sun out? I swear to God, this thing at the bottom says, do not drive while this is in place. <laughs> oh. So you get ground faults required by building codes. Uh, a lot of things done for the safety. Consumer protection laws are in there to make sure the product won't harm you. Cars, early cars were dangerous, no seat belts. I remember we had used to go on a family vacation, had a VW bus, a whole bunch of kids, take out all of the seats, throw the kids on the back floor and go driving away. You don't do that anymore, okay? Unsafe at any speed, Ralph Nader came out and things started changing. They started having uh, the safety of things. <clears throat> seat belts, airbags, warning systems, whatever. Can height swag. <laughs> Yes. Have you read the warning label that comes with a water bottle? A water bottle with a warning label. Okay, and if you got one of these hand cleaners, a warning thing. Yeah. Computers. How many of you read the warnings that say before using this device, you should be realized, you should realize that this is susceptible to hacking, that people can steal your credit cards, that there's nothing. I mean, you might get something that says, don't use the computer in the bathtub. Okay. <laughs> but, well, iPhone people, uh, never mind. Um, 
There is nothing about protecting you from cybercrime. Manufacturer just assumes word of mouth will do for the training. Manufacturer has no responsibility for delivering a safe product. Okay. Nothing on sites online requiring by law to protect personal information with, uh, except for the credit cards because they have money there, but you know, all of these sites on there to have strong encryption on passwords and things like that. They don't have to do that. No consumer protection. New technology comes out in general, get it to market, and then afterwards, laws become enacted to hold manufacturers responsible. So we should be seeing that one of these years. And litigation helps. Sometimes lawyers can be your friends. When will the manufacturers be required to do more? Privacy. Right to privacy, back in 1890, he wrote about printing technologies, newspapers, photographs, uh, how that was killing people's privacy, uh, and privacy wouldn't be around the way they knew it, okay? And then there were concerns about telephones uh, with people's privacies. We got used to it. Got used to it, and we lost a certain amount of privacy in the way. 84, George Orwell said, we'll have cameras all over the place, and people reading that book back then said, oh, this would be horrible. <laughs> it arrived, people complain a bit, but then this, privacy concerns fade because hammer, the cameras helped solve the Boston Marathon bombing. And people say, oh, so, well, maybe it's worth it. A little more privacy gone. Now in the future, okay, this, privacy. So how's this gonna be seen? Again, it does something good, probably that'll be accepted and it won't be long. We get used to it, we accept it. And we're training kids from the cradle that authority will monitor what they do. You have those cradle monitors, okay? Crib monitors, viewing daycare through webcams, cell phones with GPS so you can track where they are. Future generations will accept monitoring by authorities. You think those RFID tags for your drinks and the RCMP guys out there were just for show. <laughs> Someone is always out to get you. I had to slip that picture in because that picture's been in the past five years of my Tan Hyde presentations. But it's not my axe, it's my son's axe. It was just a picture. So, in summary, yeah, like they say, as we know it, not the end of the world, but the end of the world as we know it. So someone's out to get you, but always look at the past and think a continuum. Don't just say, hey, this is cool. Look at everything as a continuum. Remember, scale, rewards are increasing. What that means, what you can do about it, who knows? Longer chains of trust. We're trusting more and more. What does trust mean? And when something new happens, you see something new and interesting, think, is this an inflection point? Is this going to cause a great change in the way things happen? And remember, most of all, we don't learn from the past. So. What do you do? Just watch it. Nothing you can do about it. <laughs> so thank you and goodbye. I'm done with Can Heights. I say, I'm retiring. I'm going to go 
take my shoes off and sit in a tree and learn how to play the flute. <laughs> Any questions? It's, I mean, it's nothing. I didn't teach you anything. So you're not going to have questions. But anybody does. And did I bring my guitar this time? Well, I'm home. So my guitar is at home. But I don't, who knows I play guitar? <laughs> <laughs> nothing? Good. We're done early. So uh, what happens when you uh, realize how small your attention is? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm going to teach part time and do a little bit. But I'm, I'm a cheap guy. I don't even need shoes. <laughs> well, thanks for listening to me. And for all of these years, thanks to li for listening to me. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. <laughs>